Um, welcome everybody to the um, start of the autumn series, I guess, um, for um, the BCO <coughs> uh, webinars. <clears throat> um, our webinar today is called Integrating Social Value in, in Development with a kind of sub-theme of how do we build back better, fairer and greener uh, sort of after the, after the, um, the pandemic. <clears throat> First off, uh, I'd like to introduce you to um, our speakers today. I'm joined by three wise heads, eminent people. Um, first off, and I'll let them introduce themselves, but Caroline, Phil and Simon. Caroline, why don't you just quickly introduce yourself, tell them, tell everybody where you come from, what you do. Sure. Um, thank you very much, Guy. Um, my name is Caroline Wilson. I'm the Director of Inclusive Economy and Jobs here in Islington Council. Thank you very much, Caroline. And next, Phil. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Phil Mal. I'm Regional Director for Muse Developments, I'm, and I'm also a member, of, main member of the, the Muse, uh, main board member of the Muse business as well. Fantastic. Thanks, Phil. And then um, finally, Simon. Hi, uh, Simon Wilkes. I'm Head of Development at Legal and General. Uh, investment management, real assets, and oversee um, all uh, legal and general uh, investments, development uh, properties. Fantastic. Well, thanks very much, Simon, for that. Yeah, my name is Guy Battle. I'm the Chief Exec of Social Valley Portal, and I'm going to uh, guide you through today's um, webinar. Um, kicking off next slide, please, uh, Barney, with um, uh, a la the launch and an overview of the latest briefing note that the BCO has brought out. Um, I'm also the chair of the Environment Social Governance Committee at the uh, BCO. We meet on a regular basis to, um, to, to talk about the issues that are impacting the industry from an environmental sustainability perspective. And social value has been one of those things that has been running through um, as a theme for the past couple of years. Caroline's then going to jump in and talk about um, how social value impacts planning and, and what's been happening at Islington Council. Uh, then we've got Phil, who's going to give us a developer's view. Uh, and then finally, we have Simon, who's going to talk about, from a legal gen perspective, the owner and also, I guess, the investor's viewpoint as well. I've then got a few questions. I'm going to get everyone sort of um, fired up with a few challenging um, sort of challenges uh, to them, um, and then we'll open it up. But as we go through, uh, there's a Q&A at the bottom of your panel. Uh, most of you, I'm sure, have used Zoom before. Please feel free to drop a question. And after I've done my presentation, I'll start viewing those, and then we'll bring the audience in. I'll ask the questions uh, as we go through it. Next slide, please, uh, uh, Caroline and um, uh, Bryony. So um, what are we going to address today? Well, underlying this is social value. We're going to be look at the impact of social value on real estate, you know, why our plan is interested in social value and how should the community respond. Um, we're going to talk about uh, development, enter into discussion around Section 106, and one of the questions I'm going to ask the panel is how best to embed social value into uh, the process. And then finally, sort of asking around, uh, looking at how owners should address social value. Next slide, please, uh, Bryony. Um, we've got a, few, got a few polls uh, just to keep everyone on their toes. So this is our first poll. So um, if you could spend a minute just doing this. Uh, so you've got your poll, you've got a sliding bar on the right hand side. So please um, submit your answers um, and then um, we can except the panelists are not allowed to do the answers, which is always a shame. But anyway, um, we'll leave it a minute. So, Bryony, if you tell us when the most people have answered, then uh, we'll, um, we'll close that and look at the results. So what state? So I'm interested in, do you think social value should be integrated in the planning process, which we're going to cover today? Um, here we go. So we've got the answers already. So we've got, are they live? Are these live answers? They look like it. So we got um, real estate professionals coming in, it's great. Um, and then should social value be integrated in the planning process? Um, yes, it makes sense. So we've got, um, it's been interesting, we've got a couple of people saying it's a bad idea. So perhaps they can put a QA and a into the chat, not the chat, but Q&A, and then just put a question around that. 
Um, and then uh, one of the biggest challenges, integrating search value into planning. Um, and then the viability has come through. So I think we'll pick up viability uh, for sure. And then there's a whole chunk around measurement, which is kind of interesting. I think we'll talk about measurement. Um, and then do you know um, councils that have started embedding it? So what's interesting, so 32% of you, so that is, uh, I guess, around about you know, a third. So that's about 15, almost 20 of you know a council, know of a council that's doing this already. So that's, that's interesting, shows that sort of things are happening. Thanks very much, Barney. I'm going to close this down now. Um, so next slide, please. So I'm going to dive into it and just talk to you through um, the uh, work that we've been doing uh, on the technical note and give you some background that will set us up for the discussion. Next slide, please, uh, Barney. A um, little bit about who we are. So we're a platform that helps organisations, developers uh, measure uh, social value, procure social value. It's also a contract management tool and a reporting tool. Uh, and so we work closely with real estate industries to help them understand uh, and deliver social value. Next slide, please, um, Bryony. Uh, the, the note that we're launched today, <clears throat> integrating social value into development, build back greener, uh, fairer greener, goes through you know, introduction. We've talked about policy review, um, how to measure social value is important. And then we've got a little bit about sort of uh, COVID and the rise of impact, and then some important case studies that you'll be able to pick up. So. Bryony, so all members will get a <clears throat> copy of this anyway, uh, and then a non-member will be able to pick it up in due course. <clears throat> Next slide, please, Bryony. <clears throat> so where does it all start? So um, it started back actually in 2012, to some extent, 2012, 2013, when the Social Value Act came out. Uh, and this was the act that, as a sustainability consultant, I've been in sustainability for uh, 25 years now. It's the act we've been waking, waiting for all our years really um, and it requires public sector authorities to consider economic social and environmental well-being in their uh, procurement and commissioning purposes or, 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 or processes what's interesting about the act it is really transforming the relationship between the public and the private sector because the public sector is saying to the private sector if you want to work with us and get this contract we not only want the best price best quality. We also want you to tell us what more you are going to do for our communities in terms of social value. The planners and people like Caroline, <clears throat> who are in inclusive growth, been looking over the shoulders of the procurement officers and saying, that's good. I like that. I want a piece of that. And so we're now seeing quite a few planners saying, how can we embed social value into the planning process? Because why the hell aren't we also linking up with social value and creating jobs and getting developers and owners to commit to this. So we'll explore that with Caroline in a bit. Next slide, please, um, Bryony. <clears throat> um, but it's not just about the act. It's also about, you know, the ESG sort of investment. And this is a, a quote from Nigel Wilson uh, from Legal and General um, talking about um, a huge misunderstanding that social value somehow foregoes uh, delivering a commercial return <clears throat> and he like legal general thinks that pure pure nonsense so i'm going to be interested to pick this up with phil later and then and simon as well uh, about this whole issue of viability that a few of you picked up on that slide i think this is really important to to consider next slide please um so the policy <clears throat> in place um pushes this so we we have the social value act but of course uh, planning is and development is very much governed by the uh, national Pol planning policy framework and the question I guess is does it permit us to include social value into our um, into our planning submissions and are the planners allowed to consider it <clears throat> and so we've done quite a lot of uh, looking at this if you tap I uh, want tap please um, Bryony um, what we have out of the planning policy is a focus on social economic and environmental objectives. That's what the policy is all about, you know, the, um, the vision of sustainability. But of course, social value is also that as well. So for sustainability, also read social value. So in that respect, we think that social value actually is a fundamental part of the uh, planning policy framework, um, and that uh, there is absolutely no reason why it can't be considered and, and indeed should be considered as a part of the, uh, the process. Next slide, please, Bryony. But how do we define social value um, with respect to real estate? So defined as the wider contribution that the development makes to society 
through its lifetime, the development's lifetime in terms of social, economic, and environmental impact. So, for example, that could be providing jobs for young people not in education, um, supporting community groups, saving energy or reducing embodied carbon. This is all part of that triple bottom line social value. So it's, it's you know, it is a comprehensive way of talking about that broader contribution. Next slide, please, Bryony. Um, don't let anyone, anyone tell you that you can't measure social value. We've been measuring social value now for in developments for two and a half, three years. One of the first buildings we did was actually with uh, Simon, 245 Hammersmith Road. We did a project with the BCO to develop a, a measurement framework specific for um, for uh, development and that we've now been using that for I think probably three years now and it's built around a series of themes outcomes and measures um, it's become the national social value management framework or for short the national TOMS but what's important about the framework is that it allows you to put a value to the social stuff the social economic and environmental stuff that you're delivering so why is that important well if we're talking about a building that costs 40 million to deliver what the planners are interested in, investors are interested in, developers are interested in, is what, what's the proportional value that I'm contributing to society? Now this framework allows you to do that. Uh, and whilst value is not everything, it, it allows you to understand the proportion. The other thing about the framework is that it's been endorsed by the Local Government Association and has become the predominant solution picked up by councils around the country. Um, and it's also mapped against, against the global goals which is really relevant to the investment community. Next slide, please. So how is value delivered? So when you look at a full lifetime of a building, what's interesting is that it's not all about construction. In fact, construction is, is a part and it's an important part to play, but probably over a 20 year life cycle, which is short, it's probably only 15%. Um, another two parts make up the value that's contributed uh, how the site or the buildings managed. So that's the role of the property <coughs> manager. And that's something I'm going to pick up or Simon, I know is going to talk about and this changing role, I would even say transformational role for property managers, uh, but then also the occupiers, which is the big prize. How do we engage with occupiers? And is there a way of getting with a social value strategy, not only to start in planning, but roll through to the occupation, which I think is the biggest prize of all. Next slide, please, Bryony. So it is about this <laughs> life cycle approach um, and we see social value, uh, the, the strategy, the framework running through from community consultation, planning, construction, property managed occupation. So you have a common set of themes, a common measurement framework. So at every stage you, re you can report the total social value that's been delivered through the process. And of course, if you're doing multiple projects, you can begin to benchmark and compare. Next slide, please. Um, it becomes really important in planning and I will hear from um, from uh, Caroline what's happening in Islington but we've been involved in a number of planning submissions now where uh, we've we've actually helped uh, the uh, developer submit a, a, a plan we'll be calling a social value statement and that social value statement um, talks about the key priorities it then talks about who and what's being uh, developed it talks about how it's being um, developed and how it's going to be assessed and ultimately talks about delivery and strategy. We put a value to that. So when the planning committee is sitting down to understand the broader contribution of the development, they know how many people are going to get jobs, they know how many disadvantaged people get jobs, they know the volunteering in the community, how many schools are going to get hoped, and importantly they can understand the value relative to the development value. Now I'm going to be bold here and say that this type of analysis is going to supersede the socio-economic analysis that has been traditional to the uh, planning at, um, in the past. And I think the socio-economic analysis is, is kind of overdue for being reinvented because it strikes me as it's, it's all about um, sort of standard numbers and doesn't actually think about what the community needs. Next slide, please. Um, and the other, I think the other key driver in this is trust. Um, and COVID actually. Um, what's interesting about, and some of you might have seen this study out of Grove, and it, it makes you know, scary reading for developers and actually, you know, public sector. So Caroline, you're not getting away out of this. So, you know, 2% of people trust developers, only 7% of people trust local authorities. And this is around development with a massive 73 quarters want developers to be held accountable 
um, <clears throat> and likewise 72 percent want um, <clears throat> local authorities to be accountable now we see the <clears throat> the social value statement as part of that accountability so it's, it's about getting a developer <clears throat> and an owner to commit to delivering you know a certain number of things that are monitored then throughout the construction process but also through the ongoing occupation process and i think social value has a chance to really bring it alive for the citizens <clears throat> next slide please um, <clears throat> and so finally just before i wrap up key issues as i see them <clears throat> that the technical note will help you sort of through is that i think public uh, trans social tr value is transforming the public sector procurement and i think it's going to have the same impact on planning uh, we're already seeing that that sea change there. We've got Carolina, Islington, Salford, Coventry, Manchester City Council, Birmingham City. These are all major councils now looking at embedding social value into their um, policy statements. I think the National TOMS as a measurement framework uh, is, is one of the frameworks you can use in it and it puts a value to it. So it explains that broader contribution. I think helping planners understand that is important. I think contractors are already delivering it to a certain extent. I know we've got a lot of designers on the call today, professionals, and I think it's about time that the professionals stand up and recognize they've got to get involved in delivering social value too. It's not just the burden on the contracting team. I think asset managers are going to see their jobs change um, and it's going to be much more than collecting rent. It's about how you engage with occupiers and broker the relationship between the occupier and the community. And then finally, how do we get um, the occupiers engaged in delivering real social value across uh, the network? So with that, I'm going to uh, stop. I'm going to pass on to Caroline, um, who is going to tell us now uh, all about how Islington is embedding social value into their um, planning policies. Over to you, Caroline. Thank you. Thank you very much, Guy. Um, so as uh, Guy was setting out, we have uh, worked on social value very much through a procurement lens for a number of years. Um, just as I was coming on board into Islington, um, we were assuming a portfolio of uh, affordable workspaces across the borough that we had um, benefited from through Section 106 agreements. And that's very much where I came into contact with, with Guy and Social Value Portal, because for, for us it was really important um, to be able to demonstrate not only to, to developers who were giving us these really important assets in the borough, but also to, um, to local residents, the benefit of having um, these Section 106 um, assets coming in. So just to give you a bit of context, Brian, if we can move, um, is Islington kind of, comes across as a, a place of where the, where the streets are, are lined with gold. But in fact, it actually is a place of, of high deprivation. And we have the fourth highest um, rate of child poverty in the United Kingdom, which as somebody who comes from Belfast, I find really startling whenever I first came here. So you have, you have real pockets of deprivation within Islington where families face multi-generational multi unemployment, where um, families face uh, in-work poverty, they have very precarious employment, um, often in the retail and hospitality sectors. And it's, it's a place that um, where fairness or unfairness is very much endemic. So the council in 2012 set up um, a fairness commission and really looked at the issues that were that were um, in in the borough and how what are the various levers that the council could utilise to try and address that. All of this obviously has been um, exacerbated in the last four or five months um, with COVID-19. So all of the health inequalities, all of the employment inequalities um, have really hardened um, over the last while and, and it's really incumbent on us as a council and I would say society wider um, to really look at what, what it is that we can do to help um, a good recovery uh, from COVID-19. Thanks Bryony. So our underpinning framework, um, as I say, always has been driven by the idea of fairness. Um, an inclusive economy um, is an economic development framework which very much focuses on the quality of jobs. It's not about quantity of jobs and investment, it's about the quality of jobs. It's, it's good jobs, it's jobs that are well paid, that pay the London living wage, it's jobs that have good terms and conditions where people feel secure and can progress. Um, the other kind of framework that we use a lot that you'll hear us talking about is community wealth building. 
And I think that's a bit um, kind of what it does on the tin, what it says what it does on the tin. But it's very much about kind of looking at investment in a local place and how that investment is recycled in a local um, economy, in a local community. Um, and we look at five particular um, strands on this, five, uh, five um, pillars um, around employment, around procurement, which um, we've mentioned, local business ownership, so that diversification of um, who owns business. And, and for us, that's really important around small and micro businesses in Islington, and also then businesses that are democratically owned, like uh, social enterprises and cooperatives. Asset and place management, we'll, we'll talk about now, but obviously kind of property and place in Islington is an enormous um, lever, an enormous driver of equality uh, within the borough. And then the final one is around finances, which is less relevant today, but that's really about how, how we invest our things like pension funds, how we utilise um, grant aid and so on. Thanks, Brownie. So, as um, Guy said, um, working very closely with my planning colleagues, looking over their shoulder, um, we were very much, well, um, procurement gets social value. Is there any way that we can get more social value out of um, the new um, plan? Um, so we were revising our local plan um, over the last number of years, and we looked at this idea of how we can embed social, social value in it. So we have, um, you know, we've, we've done fantastic work with developers in the borough and um, we have affordable workspace, we have affordable housing, we do a lot of work around apprenticeships with developers and we strongly encourage them to use um, local supply chains. But as Guy says, that is only about 15% of the life cycle of a development in Islington. So we looked at how we could really embed the, the idea of the whole life um, cycle of a, of a building. Um, the seven objectives in the local plan are very closely aligned to our corporate objectives, so it's things around employment, the environment, and community safety, as you'd expect. Um, we had submitted um, our local plan to the independent inspector at the beginning of this year, just before COVID hit. Um, we were due to go to examination uh, just before the summer, but all of that has been slightly thrown up in the air as a result of the planning changes that have been announced by government in, the, in recent weeks, and also COVID-19, obviously. But at the moment, um, subject to the independent examiner, we think it's likely to be adopted towards the tail end of next year, early 22. So in that, thanks, Brownie, um, we have, next slide. Thank you. Um, in that, we have a policy on social, promoting social value. Um, so it is draft. I say this with the caveat that it um, hasn't been uh, gone through the independent inspectorate process, but we believe that social value really is um, a central part of the sustainable development objective of the local plan overall. We are, are encouraging all developments in the borough to maximise social value where possible. Um, but this is obviously particularly relevant to major developments. Um, so our team, the, the major developments team, will look at how um, developers can undertake a social value self-assessment. So we call it a social value self-assessment, but it's very similar um, to what Guy has described as a social value statement. And this really is where we are looking at benefits that go beyond standard level and um, compliance. And we believe that this could constitute a material consideration in the planning process. Thanks, Brownie. So the social value self-assessment, um, we have set out a number of tables um, as part of the draft local plan, um, where we believe applicants can contribute social value over the whole life of the development um, in four particular ways. One, as employer and contractor. So that is things around apprenticeships and um, over the lifetime of, of the development. It's also about being a stakeholder in the local community, so how they engage with local communities, how they encourage tenants to engage with local community, um, and that's through things like uh, work experience for schools, it's around engagement with uh, local community groups, and um, it's about volunteering. It's also how we believe that uh, development can contribute to the local um, and sub-regional economy. 
Um, so that's through the supply chain. Are there ways that the um, developer can encourage tenants and occupants to sustain that engagement with small and micro businesses in particular in a local area? So that money really, as I say, recycles in, a, in the local um, economy. And um, we appreciate that in Islington, we're a very small geographical borough. So we look at the sub-regional economy. So that's across our neighboring, neighboring boroughs. And then finally, as a steward of the environment. So what is it that the development can um, contribute in terms of things like our net zero um, ambition, net carbon zero ambitions in Islington? Applicants would then be asked to indicate how the social value will be delivered. And in a recent conversation with a, a developer, um, we find that the social value, the TOMS um, matrix, has been really useful in helping quantify um, what that social value return is. And it also is, as Guy mentioned, about that accountability. How do we ensure that um, what um, somebody says in a planning application is carried through um, over the lifetime of, a, of the of the building. Um, I suppose that's the bit that we have to work out. So we're waiting for this to go through the inspectorate and we have to develop um, detailed guidance as you would expect um, to look at how this kind of implements uh, and how, how this hits the real world in Islington. Um, but we're very excited that this is a, a real kind of chance to, to leverage um, social value over not just the period of construction, but over the longer lifetime of, of all the buildings that are here in Islington. I think that's me, Bryony. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks, Caroline. That's, that's really interesting. So I think there's a couple of issues there we'll pick up. And I think materiality is an important issue. And I think then the regionality, I'm kind of interested also exploring the fact that, you know, you see yourselves not as an island, but actually part of a wider group. Um, Phil, you're up next. <clears throat> the developer who's caught in the middle, crunched, viability, up in the air, who knows what? Tell us. <laughs> don't, don't shed any tears. Guy, will you? Um, no, th thanks for that. I, um, I thought what I would do just for this kind of short slot before we get into some of those meaty issues that guys just raised was just going to give you a snapshot really of how we've treated social value across or not uh, significantly across two schemes that pan um, 14 years to date and more than likely another 10 to 15 years going forward, but geographically are sat at side by side. And before I go on to these slides, um, I should, should recognise, uh, to I acknowledge to everybody that these, whilst I'm here under the Muse title, these are two schemes being delivered by English Cities Fund, which is a joint venture, which Muse is the de development uh, manager and Simon, uh, and legal in general of the investment manager and our partner is is Homes England. Um, but if we can move on, uh, Brian, please, to the next slide. So hopefully you'll be able to pick this, um, and I will explain it for those of you not, not familiar with uh, Manchester and Salford. So the area hopefully that you can see uh, marked blue and um, i am catching up with teams so recognizing that you guys can't tell when i'm pointing at the screen what i'm actually pointing at so i've got that little warning going on in my head um, but the area uh, shown blue is an area known as salford central and that's a development agreement we signed in 2006 at the end of 2006 with salford city council significantly deprived area of the city, the former heart of Salford uh, as a city um, and over the years for a number of social and economic reasons that had, had, had risen to the top 4% of deprived wards in the country. Uh, some of the highest car crime um, in Greater Manchester, in fact one of the streets in there had the highest car crime. Um, a lot of social housing um, around there um, and, and in truth, relatively run down social housing, uh, very little private housing or investment. So no real mixed community and no real uh, job opportunities. Again, for those of you who don't know the area, you may be able to spot the river snaking its way across the bottom diagonal of the slide. That's the river. Well, that marks the boundary 
between Salford and Manchester. And just on the other side of the river there is Spinning Fields. So Spinning Fields, again, for those of you not familiar, um, is possibly the most successful uh, commercial, part residential uh, development outside of London for decades. So that can certainly the highest office rents and values, the highest um, residential values, and literally a stone's throw across what is a very uh, short river, small river, um, you have this, this deprivation. So that's uh, Salford Central. We signed our development agreement in 2006, notwithstanding with the kind of emergence of the Social Value Act, I can say with huge amount of certainty that the word social value did not apply to this scheme in any way, shape or form, whether that was through our agreement with uh, the council in its role as a uh, regeneration partner or subsequently three or four years down the line with Salford's largest ever outlined planning consent in its role as local planning authority. Sat alongside that, you have a much larger area outlined uh, red, which is a scheme we have uh, just uh, exchanged agreements on following a very detailed OGU uh, process where we've been appointed the development partner for Salford Council and the university to uh, regenerate a large part of uh, the continuing uh, part of the city centre and around the campus of Salford University. Uh, this area is at Salford Crescent. So um, that, um, to give you some context of the size of development in, in both of them, uh, Salford Central covers 50 acres or so. We delivered or delivering there are thereabouts a million square feet of commercial space. We're going up, going past or just up to a thousand homes at the moment, and probably finish up around twelve hundred homes, and then associated shops and facilities. We've probably got three or four years to run uh, with a fur wind on that scheme. Uh, Salford uh, Crescent has the ability to deliver three million square feet of commercial space over 2,000 homes, and again, associated retail and, 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 and leisure. So hopefully that gives you a context. Uh, that itself will probably have a 10 to 15 year uh, life. Um, apart from them being sat side by side geographically, I just thought they were quite an interesting, again, comparison in the emergence of social value. So as I say, Salford Central had no reference whatsoever to uh, social value. And I'll be completely honest, uh, everything we achieved for a number of years was done through, I would like to think, through goodwill and purpose, but with no real intent. Salford Crescent, a huge part of the scoring process was we were judged on social value and how we would be, how we would capture that, uh, both in terms of policy, so setting out at day one, the, the plan, so not retrofitting it, setting out the, the plan, uh, demonstrating very clearly how that um, uh, dealt with the local community's needs, not just a one size fits all, how we would then deliver it, measure it long into the future. So a real kind of juxtaposition there of, of, of the emergence of, of policy. Uh, Brian, if you could move on a slide, please. Uh, to give you a, an idea of Salford Central, so you can see spinning fields to the top right diagonal there of, of, of the screen and the rest was a sea of car parking in this part of the scheme. So you can see the car parking there, you can see a cleared site, that was also car parking um, as was where you, can, you may just be able to see the uh, crane on the right hand midpoint of the slide there, that, that was car parking. So. You could argue, in fact, I would strongly argue that in terms of contributing to the local community, it was actually taking out. So just running down the, down the uh, into the scheme is, is the main A6 uh, road. So the vast majority of commuters coming into this side of Manchester would drive down there, cause congestion, park very cheaply on these uh, car parks, walk across the river, go and earn, um, uh, drink, spend, shop in Manchester and then of an evening come back across, jump in cars, 
pollute the cha pollute Chapel Street on the way back through and head off to all parks in the northwest. So actually, was it adding social value? No, it was actually removing it. So um, if we can move on to the next slide, Brian, please. This is a relatively recent image which shows some of the work uh, that we've done. So new offices, uh, new residential, sweeped up those surface uh, car parks and put them into uh, multi-stories, infrastructure improvements. So um, in terms of hard value add, uh, I would say there's a huge amount of social value there. And uh, maybe in the q and I'll, I'll elaborate on Nigel Wilson's point around the fact that why these things aren't uh, contradictory. Um, we can move on, uh, Brian, if please. Uh, not just about the hard stuff. So again, this was the car parking. We've, we've introduced a lot of um, community work uh, here. And we've raised uh, tens and tens of thousands of pounds for local charities. At the bottom left, there is the annual uh, duck race where um, ducks race down, plastic <coughs> ducks down um, at the River Irwell. Every single one is captured and then recycled. And before that question pops up on the bottom of the screen, uh, we're very, very conscious of, of, of that. And it, 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 it not only creates that, it also supports a lot of uh, new businesses. So just to give you a, a, a flavor really, we engaged a guy to look at um, how um, I wouldn't say by accident, because I think there was a genuine intent there, but without hanging it on any policy, but um, how we, and what social value we'd added to date in, uh, in Salford Central. And in, in, in monetary terms, uh, that's about 50 million pounds of social value, value added. And in uh, percentage terms, that's about 18, 19%. So without even trying as I say, but albeit with some good intent. To give you a flavour of what we're targeting on uh, the Crescent, uh, we're targeting 30 to 45% of uh, social value added, where we can actually target what we're doing. And what might that look like? Well, again, maybe we'll get into this in a little more detail, but as a Guy alluded to on one of his slides, I'm very, very much for want to prick the ears of the consultants on the screen, uh, sorry, on the, um, on the webinar, it will not stop at the contractor. So anybody who wants to work on our scheme will contribute to the local economy, whether that's the architect, whether that's the engineer, and it needn't, it needn't be a monetary thing. So it may well be the right person from the team uh, going into a local school and creating aspiration. Um, one, one area that we're very targeted on, on here is needs. Um, guy, guy working with us um, certainly uh, uh, highlighted on and, and landed on the fact that that's, a very, that's a, still a significant issue in Salford. So a lot of work to come and, and certainly pick up some of those threads in, in, in the Q&A, but I'll, uh, I'll hand on to Simon. Great. Thanks uh, very much, Phil. And uh, Simon, shall we jump into you now? <clears throat> and if Simon, okay. I can encourage you just to um, <clears throat> move as Be rapidly quick. as you feel sensible um, so we've got a decent amount of time for discussion. Thanks Simon. Okay, uh, straight to the next slide then. <clears throat> um, today I'm uh, going to briefly cover uh, LNG's approach to sustainability and social value at the corporate level, that's LNG PLC, but also explain in greater detail the approach to ESG and social value that's taken by the Real Assets team. Uh, next slide. Um, it's probably fair to say that the property industry has been focused on sustainability for a considerable time, uh, primarily through schemes um, such as BRIAM, um, where for a long time the property industry has been assessing new developments uh, against that uh, uh, essentially a scoring system. But I suppose make no mistake um, sort of where ESG or social value now uh, sits um, and it's, a very, it's at the very top of the corporate agenda. Um, this is actually the current landing page for Legal and General PLC's website. Um, 
So the first thing you see when you go to PLC's website is improving lives through inclusive capitalism. Our purpose is to improve the lives of our customers, build a better society for the long term and create value for our shareholders. We use our long term assets in an economically and socially useful way to benefit everyone in our communities. So you can see the first thing you see when you hit LNG's website is essentially uh, the concept of social value. Um, next slide. Um, and that's not just a marketing statement um, on the PLC website. Um, these are a number of initiatives, investments made by uh, PLC, effectively balance sheet uh, shareholder, shareholder money. Um, so it's very much along the themes of Nigel Wilson's comment that commercial market investments um, need not necessarily sort of fail to deliver social values. So these are good investments, but they also deliver um, social values. So we have an affordable housing company who've got a commitment to deliver 3,000 affordable uh, homes per annum. We've invested in um, a number of um, um, urban centres, Cardiff, Newcastle, Bracknell. Um, there's a PLC commitment to be net zero by 2050. We've invested a billion in wind farms, solar energy, uh, investment in Podpoint, the EV charging company. Uh, transport, um, we've committed 200 million of long-term finance to Wales and Borders. Uh, railways for uh, advanced hybrid trains. Um, we run an education programme, Everyday Money programme, which helps educate the young in terms of finance and money. Green spaces are crucial in terms of parts of you know, our developments, such as 245 Hammersmith, have delivered parks and uh, open space. Uh, we've got a 50-50 JV with Oxford University to deliver affordable homes and innovation districts. Science centres, we've invested in digital infrastructure. We have a modular ha uh, housing construction facility and we've invested in health and, and care. So, a lot of these PLC investments, they're commercial investments, but they have a, have a theme of social value running through them. Uh, next slide. Um, turning to uh, real estate, uh, ESG is really at the heart of what LNG do as a developer and investor with real estate. Our ESG strategy policy for real assets um, really has four limbs. Low energy, um, net zero carbon is one, social value, health and well-being, and occupier engagement, which is badged as soft landings. So that's the property corporate speak for sort of occupier engagement. Um, why, why do we have such a strong ESG policy? Um, we, we firmly believe that sustainable assets will outperform in the long run and provide better investment returns. Um, we have an advantage because we, we have what's called patient capital. It means we can take a very long-term view on our returns longer than um, other investors and developers. I think we also recognise that what we do has a significant impact on society and, and the local environment. Um, and we also believe that to improve what we do and deliver social value, we have to measure our performance uh, and try to do better. Um, we also have a strong track record on delivery through schemes such as BRIAN, uh, EPC targets. Um, we also have all our funds analysed under the Gresby method of assessment. Um, we're also very forward thinking. Um, we co-funded the BCO Social Value Measurement Project. And we've also been early advocates of uh, embedded carbon analysis, um, um, a new process called Design for Performance, um, uh, which helps minimize carbon in, at the operation level, uh, as well as during construction. And community engagement is, is, is a core part to all our major projects. Uh, next slide. Um, 
in terms of social value and the real assets team, it's it's a core. It's one of the core four parts of our ESG strategy. Um, so as well as funding the BCO study, uh, along with Guy, we've developed uh, uh, with social social value portal a bespoke measurement framework for our assets and, and portfolios to help us analyse what we're doing. Um, on development projects where we're developing our own right, we measure social value through the design, pro procurement, and construction phases of a project. But as Guy has highlighted, 70% of the social value of a project is delivered through um, the occupation investment phase uh, of the assets. So that sort of phase post practical completion becomes critical to deliver, delivering or maximizing the social value in an area. Uh, next slide. Um, so I thought I'd just give you a couple of um, practical examples of uh, projects and investments where so significant social value has been delivered and, and measured. Um, the first one was Central St Giles, which was a major development in Covent Garden, uh, delivered uh, sort of through from 2007 through to 2010. And, um, we, we delivered things through that project which we didn't realise or were badged as social value at the time, um, but as part of the project we funded a local community garden. We've actually formed a long-term partnership with the local primary school um, where we provide uh, two governors uh, to the, to the uh, to school. We offer property expertise and finance expertise uh, and chair those committees. Um, and we also provide a lot of premises expertise. We've raised a lot of capital from local developers through rights of light agreements and Section 106 payments. Um, and we've helped deliver a new early years classroom with that money, refurbished the playground and new kitchen. So all the team on that project, the architects have done the designs and uh, our contractor helped deliver. So the whole project helped uh, deliver that benefit to the local school. Then uh, so 245 uh, Hammersmith Road, um, we wrote social value targets uh, into the construction contract and the professional appointments uh, and that project's helped to deliver over 28 million of added social value. But probably the critical stage is the post-practical completion and our managing agents have social value targets written into their appointment um, which they're measured against, and it's one of their um, sort of key aspects that their performance is assessed against. Um, so I think sort of both those projects are examples um, where along with our occupiers, we engage with the local community and a big part of the management of the building post practical completion is the property managers taking on that social value work uh, and working with the occupiers as they fill the buildings to become engaged with the local uh, community in, um, in Central St Giles and Hammersmith, um, the occupiers are now engaged with local businesses, the community and the school as well. So we really try to keep that sort of social value process running through the occupation stage. Um, next slide. And um, that's the impact, the sort of, um, I suppose the sort of gratitude and thanks you get from the local community for sort of not just committing money to the project, but committing time and expertise um, to, to help the community and, uh, and help the, uh, the people who live there. Great, Simon. Thanks very much. I, I love the way it's, it's, it's titled, Dear Builders. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you are just a builder, Simon, at the end of the day, my friend. I know. That, that's, that's, investor. You're just yeah. a builder. <laughs> yeah, just a builder. <laughs> Fantastic, that's great. Okay, we've got final poll. Um, another few questions. Brian, do you want to bring it up? And then we'll, uh, we'll dive into a discussion. So this is very much around the um, uh, process. How do you think social value be included in the planning process? Um, just part of the submission, supplementary information, um, not sure. Um, so as part of the submission, yeah, that would be section 106 or something like that. 
Um, how would you like social value commitments to be managed post planning? So sex 106, a condition, um, no, just trust the developer. I'm wondering if Caroline's smiling at that point. Um, do you think occupiers should be subject to social value requirements as they already are in green travel plans? Yes, that's kind of interesting, isn't it? I like that. A lot of people think yes. And then do you think it is even more important to embed social values of planning to help us recover from the pandemic? Yeah, okay, fine. So I think that's more or less it, actually. Another... I think we can uh, dive into it. That's fine. Um, but we've still got so few people voting. Okay, so I think we're probably good. Let's let's close that now, um, Bryony. That poll. That's great. Thanks everybody for that. Uh, and I think that's that's kind of interesting. So look, why don't we um, why don't we kick off? Uh, if you do the next slide, please. Um, Actually, you can show, probably show all our, our faces now. Yeah, that's great. Um, so where, where, where should we start? So I think I'd start with um, um, Caroline, um, and just looking at um, the, you know, the, the, the role in the plan in all of this. And um, I'm kind of interested in, um, in sort of your relationship with developers and why, why do you feel the need for having some form of social value assessment, you know, in the discussion with the developers and, and how are you going to make sure that developers, owners actually get on deliver it? Um, I suppose uh, for me, the thing that we fundamentally want to get out of social value is that connection to the local place, that it's um, not just uh, it's social value that happens anywhere. It's social value that happens in Islington or, or within Islington's neighbouring boroughs. Um, because, you know, the, the, the connection to places is, is the really, is the bit for me that, that's, that's missing sometimes. And that's, that's what we really want to get out of it. And it's kind of working with progressive developers. So there are developers, you know, both Simon and Phil have, have kind of clearly demonstrated that they are very responsible developers. So I completely want a piece of that action for Islington residents. For those, because um, I think there are real long-term benefits in terms of, you know, um, connections to local communities. I mean, we have um, local communities who live next door to the Knowledge Quarter, which is all around the, the King's Cross development, who, who would never cross the threshold of, of King's Cross. And they wouldn't get a job there. They wouldn't, um, they wouldn't go there to socialise. They, they wouldn't go there to kind of spend any leisure time in green space. So for me, when kind of developers like, like Phil and, and Simon are saying, we're going into schools, we're doing community engagement activities, that creates a sense of I'm valued in that place and that place values, values me. So for me, that's um, absolutely why social value has to go beyond the construction phase. It is, it's totally about kind of that recycling investment in a, in a local place and in local people. And um, because ultimately this is about local people for, for the council. Yeah, what, I was, yeah, what I was interested in, in as well, the, you, you list out a few motives there. And I think the last motive you mentioned about, I can't remember what it was, but you also mentioned your pensions. So yeah. you are, you as a local council invest into pensions that Simon is, is now managing. Simon's actually, yeah. I don't know if he's managing your pensions, but people like Simon are managing your pensions. And so it's kind of interesting how that, that loop sort of rolls around. And I think there's something about being responsible with, with money, isn't there, in all of this? Yeah, and, and it's about treating people, local people, for me, local people with, with dignity and respect. And, you know, that they're not, I mean, the... the Gentrification was a term that was coined in Islington, and it's yeah. so often. And, and this is why develop, there's low trust in developers, and as it turns out, low trust in local authorities too. But it, it's not about removing local communities and, and building over the top of them. Th this has to be a, a new generation of development that, that is about building back better. It is about yeah. Yeah. including people and not 
gating people off so, um, so from those like developments. I mean, that's a really important point. I'd just like to pick up with Phil on that. This whole challenge around gentrification, which in a way cuts to the core of what social value is about, because on the one hand, social value says, engage with the local community that's already there, support them, make them grow. But on the other hand, you want to sell your properties for as much as possible. You know, want to raise the prices because that's how land value accrues. So I'm kind of interested in how, how do you manage that sort of that apparent conflict? And then also really interested in what's happened since 2006, where you kicked off Central to, you know, 2019, 2020, when, you know, we won Sulphur Crescent. Um, yeah, I think the, 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 the first one was the far more challenging question. So I'll, um, I will, rather than come at it the other way around, I'll, I'll, I will tackle that, uh, that one first. Um, it's, to, 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 be, to be blunt, it's at times you're walking a tightrope because in, unless we create value in the monetary sense, we can't create social value whether that's in the monetary or the community sense, because otherwise all you finish, your, all you're left with is, this, is the status quo. Um, so as I say, we had a sea of surface, surface car parking here and then an image that I didn't show you was a series of burnt out hubs and, and derelict buildings. They were generating nothing for the community. In fact, they were taking out of the community. So the development that's gone back in has created an um, opportunity, it's created um, homes, it's created jobs across a, a wide range of, of scales. Um, and there was nothing there before. So yeah, yeah. I suppose that term of gentrification, um, have we improved the area in terms of its fabric, um, its connectivity, its opportunity? Abs absolutely, we have. Um, We've reached a tipping point now, interestingly enough, in Central were, in Salford Central were, um, when we first started investing, and I alluded to it on the slides, there was, it was a sea of uh, social housing and no, no private housing. Well, that, that was just creating one fixed community. Um, the council, to be fair, said to us, at this moment in time, affordable housing isn't an issue for us in this location. We actually need to mix the community. So we need to get um, other forms of development in there, but not gated, nothing that turns its back, it's yeah. inclusive. And that's what we did. And in terms of one of the things that's changed, to answer the second question, is that there is now a shift back towards, okay, or well, they've delivered a lot of um, a range of different housing, family, PRS, built to rent. Actually now, perhaps we have reached the point where we need to introduce some more affordable back in. So, so, so that, that has changed. Um, I think as a developer, I think um, the, the, two, the, the two things that jump out at me really are that one, um, we can't do it on our own. So this has to be, the, the delivery of the product is the first part of a process. So, if you imagine that, and the slide said it all, that 70% of value is actually added in occupation, not in, in development. There is only so much we can do to, to incentivize the ongoing occupiers to continue adding value. That in the sense has to come from society. So um, it's, it's not dissimilar to a requirement to put electric car charging points into a development. But unless you incentivize then the users of that development to go okay. and buy electric cars, it's a waste of time. So it has to, it has to span yeah. all of those uh, things. I think as a developer, we just have to be a little bit more um, upfront and honest about what we can achieve rather than telling people okay. what we think they want to hear. So it's not our scheme, but just a very quick, quick point. And um, I think we're, one of the issues Media City had was that it talked about the number of jobs that could be created locally and gave the impression that they would all go to Salford residents yeah. at day one. Actually, it needs to build in and not dissimilar to what Caroline said there, and King's Cross, you've then got to create links into those opportunities. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that's right. That's why I've always, I mean, I'm now, you know, just, I don't, I'm not sure the socioeconomic analysis any longer is 
or how relevant it is because it talks about the number of jobs but it doesn't really talk about who gets the jobs and nor does it talk about any focus on building local skills so people can get those jobs and I think it for me the the time of that 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 sort of assessment is kind of dead I'd just like to pick up with Simon on the occupier thing because quite a few people in the poll have said you know it makes sense to engage the occupiers in some form or other so what, what, what are the challenges around that and and how have you gone about um sort of reimagining the role of the property manager that i think is probably crucial in this um, yeah it, it's not as hard as as you would think um uh, i mean we develop we do our own developments and then we have a huge investment portfolio um, but when we finish the development and we recruit our management team um, it's a big part of uh, I suppose the team selection as to uh, whether we think they can help deliver social value. As the building starts to fill up with large corporate occupiers you're sort of pushing at an open door because most of our occupiers have their own ESG policies and it, it's, it's way up their thinking. So what we tend to find on developments is we have a, a social value process in place that's run through the development period. And we um, write into our management contracts the, that the property managers should engage with the community. Um, we assess the social value that they create and one of the first things they do is they create and it's called various things it could be an ESG committee for the building um, but we have an occupier forum within each building and it's very easy for the development team and the management team to brief the occupiers the new occupiers on this is what we've done in the community to date and um, nine times out of ten they are very very interested in becoming involved and helping yeah. out because um, it's an easy win for them it adds to their own sort of um, internal targets and, and policies so it's, it's not as hard as you seem but it you do need to have the right management team um, can we just turn on that little bit Simon the management team so I know we've got quite a few um, management um, uh, property managers on the on the call today so what's your message to them where, where do you think their how do you think their job and their role is changing if if i mean it, it is changing because i know you're changing it uh, at 245 but what's your message to the property managers on the call um i think the i suppose the to really sum it up is we're looking for our property managers to create a community and that's um both within the building with within the various occupiers but also to bring in people outside the building into that community so uh, we're quite unusual in terms of we encourage local residents associations and various community groups to use our building so we allow them into the building to use the facilities uh, for community uses free of charge um, so uh, a lot of our schemes involve public okay. space which we open up to the community so you've really got to have um sort of i suppose a managing agent who's who's up for sort of building that community interesting. And, inside and, and outside the building and, and then caroline um just i'm kind of interested in your role in that um well i mean do, do you like what simon's just said about this new type of property manager of course what they're going to need to do is reach out to you I mean, you being Islington, and you need to make it as easy as possible for them to connect occupiers with programs. So do you have un oven baked programs for occupiers to get engaged with if the property managers came to you? Are you forward thinking like that? Absolutely, and um, I, I suppose, because I, I was going to say exactly the same thing in response to, to what Phil is saying. For me, the, the social value piece in planning starts a new dialogue with developers because you so th there's kind of the, the hard planning negotiation and i i'm not part of that and um i i leave that to very expert people 
But for me, that kind of soft ecosystem, that kind of social value wraparound is very much where, you know, I come in. And that, and that is where, you know, Simon's saying that very progressive companies. So, you know, for instance, we have a really interesting dialogue at the moment with LinkedIn, who've just in the last 12 months moved their headquarters here to, to Islington. They want, they are, they're going to do lots of CR, CSR activities, but their primary focus is they want to do it in Islington first. So we have to make it as easy. So we have programs like the 100 hours of the world of work, where we guarantee every school child under the age of 16 will have 100 hours um, of any sort of exposure to the world of work. We have um, brokers who will um, kind of support people through a coaching process um, into apprenticeships and into to jobs. We can um, do sifting for jobs. So, so we do have kind of various both community and social, community and voluntary sector um, pieces. We have economic and you know, job development pieces as well. So we do that, and for me that's that dialogue piece is okay. when a developer comes and says, here's what our social value statement is for a new development. We can say, all right, well, we can help you with that. We can help you with that. But we don't know quite about that, but we'll definitely help you with something. And that is where you, you start to break down that division between the, the glass towers of yeah. King's Cross and local communities. Okay, that's really interesting. So, um, Phil, I'd just like to bring you in, and I know that obviously you and Simon are um, scrupulous as opposed to unscrupulous, as to quote Caroline. Um, but I, just in terms of delivery of social value, we had, I mean, that's, I'm just looking at the poll asking the question, should social value be in section 106? Should it be condition or should we just trust the developer to get on with it? What's your thought about that? Because plainly there's issues around viability, around flexibility, legal issues and burden. But where do you sit on that? What do you think should happen? I, um, I mean, first, first of all, I don't, with, within reason, provided that it, there's a sensible dialogue on it, I don't actually see that it's necessarily a viability issue. There's okay. so much blatant social value in a scheme that can be unlocked just by being aware of it. Uh, you needn't put a lump sum in um, other than exorbitant social value portal fees. You needn't put in a lump <laughs> sum of, um, of costs. Uh, in that, it's about being very aware of and the value that you can release that's already there. So as, as Simon mentioned, there are a lot of uh, people that you work with in your team and then occupiers that you attract will have policies that just wait to be used. In fact, if you go to them and say, why don't you do this? It sometimes saves them a job of having to think and go out and do their own thing. So it's there to be captured. And where do I think it needs to land? I suppose it's more of a practical point really. Um, if it's a condition, is it a condition that requires you to submit and then um, and then agree a social value policy or then then the kind of conditions discharged and how then does it have any teeth uh, 106 agreements i think that the, the, the reality is is that unless it's resourced within the local authority to monitor it and engage then again it can be there's an element it could be an element of of, of lip service as right. you know, old requirements in 106 agreements for local labour agreements and that sort of thing that you know, got, 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 got through a committee stage and then you know, frankly if you went to the council and said right I'm ready to do this you didn't have anybody to speak to about it so it's a, it's a difficult answer guy to be able, want to answer really because it depends on the authority and its willingness to engage at the beginning and then onwards but I have no issue with it being captured okay. somewhere as long as it just doesn't become well, and what do you think what do you think simon on on this issue of conditions section 106 what, what where do you sit with your developer hat as opposed to owner hat on um i think first of all you've got to recognize that there are some scrupulous and some unscrupulous developers um personally i think having some sort of social value statement within probably the section 106 um is is probably the way to go because I think it actually will force developers to think about social value. Uh, I think it could easily be forgotten yeah. in a lot of schemes. So I think if it 
um, if it does form some part of the uh, section 106 then I think it focuses people's minds and um, it doesn't it, it does take some fees to release it. it it's only by measuring it that you know what you can do what what and what more you can do so you need to measure it and there is a small fee um, allowance to do that but uh, I think it's if it's in a plan document it will focus people's minds and I think um, a lot of a lot more developers would come on board uh, to okay. proactively deliver it if it was in one of the sort of planning do um, documents. Can you talk to me a little bit Simon about sort of the the investors how because obviously LNG investment management your, your investors as well so I'm kind of interested from the investor perspective why they might think social value is uh, you know is is any use whatsoever to them yeah well i suppose you're thinking of leading general as an investor which we are we're investing billions in all sorts of different assets but you have to ask where our money comes from it comes from people who are investing in lng so pension funds private individuals isa money um, they are trusting uh, legal and general to invest their money on their behalf mm. you know we are investing primarily other people's money um, and what we are finding is increasingly people who are trusting us with their money are asking us serious questions about our ESG policies our social value our uh, net zero carbon strategy so um, our view is our our business as, a, as an investment company will not continue to thrive unless we deliver what, our, what those people are investing in us want, and that is they want socially responsible investment. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So unless, unless we do it and invest like that, um, our business will, will not thrive in the long term. Okay, that's great. So we've got a couple of minutes left now. So I'm going to ask each of you just to um, just tell, tell me Sort of, where do you see social value going? What what ambition do you have with it? I'll start out off with Caroline. Um, what ambitions we have with it? I mean, I, I see I see social value um, very much at the moment being about the coalition of the willing and and working with those progressive kind of developers, investors, and occupiers. Um, to deliver real local value, not just social value, but local value. Um, and, and that is fundamentally our ambition is local, in a word, Guy. <laughs> <laughs> but, it, but local could also mean the next door neighbouring. Yeah, uh, yeah, no, I mean, local's important. I, I so hear we, you. For, for us, it's about, local, it's about local jobs, but local jobs don't just happen in right. the four square miles of say Education, education, education. I think you just told me local, local, local. That's um, it. Phil, <laughs> tell me, what's your ambition? I, I, I think we're, we're, we're at the, the, the first of perhaps two stages, I think, but for, for those who are engaged in it, I think we're in the stage of picking the low hanging fruit. So, you know, the opportunities, as I've already said, that are already there, that you just simply have to apply yourself to unlock. I think then we, it, we, it will make sense then to move on to the second stage, which will be the more challenging conversations around, well, look, if we actually move to a point of investing money in unlocking social value, um, I think there's a point on one of Caroline's slides where it, it can then become a material consideration in, yeah. in planning terms and can be considered in, in the round. So in, in the same language as affordable housing and everything else. So I think that's, for me, that's the direction of travel. And I, I quite like that direction of travel. Actually, it does keep things huh. uh, very local, which yeah. is what, you know, exactly what, what you know, the, the So that word materiality, should, material. Yeah consideration yeah. was important thanks yeah. uh, and finally simon tell me your vision uh, ambition um vision i i think the yeah in a lot of a, a lot of places now a planning applications made and probably the local community grown and and fear what's going to happen in terms of the disruption noise pollution it's it's a selfish development i think well, what I'd like to see is that actually in the future when 
um, people bring forward developments um, that actually the community view this as this could be a good thing for our community in terms of the infrastructure, the environment it's delivering and, and the benefits to the local community. So I think if we can get to a stage where the local community welcome um, <laughs> developments and developers. <laughs> Yeah, push that percentage. Why not? Because, That's a great ambition. <laughs> um, you know, and, and when we switch those percentages round, we've we've done a good job. Yeah, absolutely. Oh. Okay, with that with that very high ambition, I'm going to uh, close the conversation. Um, so look, uh, let me thank very much uh, Caroline, Phil, and Simon. I think. Uh, uh, you all agree that was a really interesting uh, discussion debate. I could have gone on for another uh, two minutes totally. But anyway, uh, enough said. I, I'll let you all get back to your, your days. But thanks very much. And we'll be sending out the uh, technical note, briefing note for everybody. And um, we look forward to catching up with you on the next webinar. So thanks again. Thanks, Simon, uh, Phil and, and Caroline. And we'll, um, we'll speak soon. Bye. Thanks. Thank you.